What is going on, everybody? It is so good to be back. Thank you for your patience coming off a two-week hiatus on this series as I traveled around Europe with my wife. But it is so good to be back, and today we march back into our Deep Dive series with my 26th-ranked team heading into next season in the New Orleans Saints, a team that feels like it's yet another year here where they're trying to thread a tiny needle between trying to stretch out whatever this winning window looks like, trying to compete in a garbage NFC South, taking those pieces from the Drew Brees, Sean Payton era, and doing what they can with it, while also trying to bridge the gap and transition into whatever the next version of the New Orleans Saints is going to be and supposed to look like. It's been a very challenging team to talk about. Some might call it a competitive rebuild. Some might call it getting stuck in purgatory. But we're going to try to navigate those waters, talk about what they have to do here this season to accomplish their dreams of winning the NFC South, while also highlighting some of the potential building blocks for, you know, excitement into the future for the Saints. Before we do get started, if you could please take just a second to hit that like button. It really does help me out if you enjoy the series. If you enjoy this video, it takes just a second. I really appreciate it. And of course, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of the remaining 25 deep dives as we lead up to the number one team in my power rankings heading into next season. And we will start, as always, by taking a look at this team's offseason, where they got better, where they got worse, where they may have stayed the same. And this was a really quiet offseason for the New Orleans Saints. And I say that in the absolute best of ways. Look, I'm going to try to be as excited about this team as possible and paint the picture of where there are some young players and areas for positivity. But at the end of the day, I've been very critical of this team and Saints fans have really caught up to this line of thinking for the most part in that, look, you can only stretch this thing so thin. You can only kick money down the road into future seasons with restructures and void years for so long. You can only trade future first round picks to, you know, move up in the draft and go get your guys so many times before you just get stretched a little bit thin and your resources start to run out. And whether they made a conscious decision seemingly for the first time in 10 years or their hand was forced because they did just run out of cap space and everything, whether it was intentional or not, I think in the best of ways, this was finally an offseason for the Saints where they didn't really borrow from the future. Granted, they had to do some restructures and some stuff just to get back over the cap because as they like to operate, they headed into this season yet again, 95 plus million dollars over the cap, right? So they have to do some stuff in terms of moving money around so that they can play football this year under the rules. But really, with the exception of one big signing being Chase Young, they let guys go, are trying to get younger. They're going to, you know, try to compete this year to the best of their ability. But it really does feel like for the first time, Mickey Loomis and company running this team said, hold on, where is this truly going and how can we bridge this into the future? And I, I think that's encouraging to see for the Saints. Now, with that, given they were $95 million over the cap, they didn't have the most exciting offseason, right? And at least as we start looking at the offensive side of the ball, nowhere is really notably improved. Now, let's start with some changes in the coaching staff, which they're hoping will be an improvement. They say goodbye to offensive coordinator Pete Carmichael and bring in Clint Kubiak. We'll talk more about Clint and what this offense is going to look like. I think that's very much to be determined. I think both Pete Carmichael and Clint Kubiak are unproven in their own right. They clearly uh, were ready for a change there. Um, but as you look at the roster, I mean, seriously, man, quarterback, listing that as neutral. Jameis Winston, a good backup out the door. They spend a fifth-round pick on Spencer Rattler, who is a dart throw at a potential, you know, bridge into a new era of Saints football, if, if they can hit on that. But running back, literally, no change. Tight end, no change. So neutrals across the board there. And then wide receiver, some changing names here, but in sum, not a lot of money spent here. And I think a net neutral on their team. They do say goodbye to Michael Thomas and his substantial salary. He was 
adequate when he played last year. He did actually make it through 42% of the team's snaps, but I don't think they're going to miss him all that much. Lynn Bowden, depth piece, also leaving. And then they, you know, bring in a couple of veteran wide receivers that have played Cedric Wilson, Equinemius St. Brown. They spent a fifth round pick on Bub Memes. So filling in that wide receiver room on the cheap. But again, staying neutral in that room. And then on the offensive line, this is where their hand was forced to do something, specifically with that first round pick being Talise Fuanga. They are entering the season with some wild uncertainty as it relates to their franchise right tackle, Ryan Ramchek. And this could be a situation where as we get closer to the season, we get a little bit more clarity on whether or not he's going to play. But as of this recording, June 21st, it certainly is leaning towards a no-go on Ryan Ramchek. And that's obviously going to create a lot of uncertainty basically replacing that piece in in a bit of a way with Talise Fuanga, even if he might play on the other side of the offensive line. Um, But significant snaps lost as well in the left side of their line in Andrews Pete and James Hurst, two 30-plus-year-old veterans that have been on this team for a long time and are no longer with them. Even Max Garcia gave them a handful of starts last year. So a lot of starts out the door. And then really the only exciting investment there is that first round pick in Fuanga. Uh, You know, some guys that have played, have started games, Lucas Patrick, Ole Udo, Shane Lemieux, no one they're counting on to be starters for them this year. But I am going to leave that as to be determined, just to be nice, I guess. If Ryan Ramchek could play maybe starting in October, this could potentially be upgraded if you now have two good tackles as opposed to just one. But obviously, that's a lot of pressure on Fuanga to step in at that tackle position, and you're going to be left with a lot of uncertainty. So it does certainly feel at this point in time that the offensive line will be downgraded, but will play nice here. Um, Then you look at the defense, and pretty much the same. It's mostly just rookies coming in here, and the one big signing they did make, I mentioned Chase Young in, in the edge room. But in terms of asking if each group got better or worse, um, you know, on the interior defensive line, I'm just going to have slightly downgraded. Nothing I'm really worried about, but I do like Malcolm Roach. thought he was a nice signing for the Broncos. Only played a quarter of this team's snaps last year, but really the only piece they're adding to that group is a sixth-round pick in Christian Boyd, unproven. We'll talk more about him later. I, it's not that I didn't like that pick, but uh, probably a slight downgrade in terms of rotational depth there. And then on the edge, that is going to be upgraded. Chase Young was a nice signing, though not a slam dunk. Again, we'll talk about him later on when we go through the roster portion of this video. Pretty clear upgrade, though, over Zach Bond. This edge group last year really was missing a guy that can win one-on-one reps. They're hoping Chase Young can be that. Zach Bond actually stood out to me on film, and he's a, a notable loss, but... You know, he's not better than Chase Young. So we are going to say upgraded in the edge group. At linebacker, they did actually do some stuff I like. Definitely filled out the depth, protected themselves from another Pete Werner injury very well. They bring in Willie Gay, who's done some good stuff as a kind of third weak side backer for the Chiefs. They also brought in Kalik Hudson, who popped to me on film when I was watching Commander's film from last year and spent a fifth round pick on Jalen Ford. So while they're not replacing a starter, and making this a significantly upgraded group. And to be fair, Zach Bond did play some linebacker for them, um, who they lost. But this is a slightly upgraded group with the linebackers without having to really spend a whole lot of money. Cornerback also going to leave this as neutral. Um, This is all, you know, taking a look at how well Isaac Yidam actually played for this team last year, played half their snaps last year and was out of nowhere really good. So even if Kool-Aid McKinstry in the second round was a really nice pick, and I get why they did that, and you don't necessarily expect Isaac Yedem to repeat his performance from last year, if you're really asking, is Kool-Aid McKinstry going to be better than what Isaac Yedem was for them last year? Um, It's certainly unlikely, as good of a prospect as Kool-Aid was. Um, But just out of respect for me liking Kool-Aid McKinstry, um, we'll leave that as neutral, but... 
some Saints fans might say that room was upgraded, and I think that's just disingenuous to the fact that Isaac Udom actually stepped up and played really well for them last year. Um, and then they bring in Will Harris, guy that's played, um, you know, for Detroit as a dime back. Uh, and then in the safety group, by name, this does look like a downgrade, but Marcus May was really an inconsequential signing for them and an inconsequential player overall. And Jordan Howden stepped up really well in the second half of the year. So a loss that they're comfortable with and not enough for me to say that that room is truly downgraded. And then no change with the special teams either with their rookie kickers and punter back next year. So again, a quiet off season by Saints standards. But, you know, I think a lot of Saints fans and those that have been following my analysis of this team over the years, I think that's good, right? Like, Let's start to think about the future a little bit more in New Orleans without losing a bunch of guys, right? The team isn't necessarily worse than they were last year, but they seem at least a little bit more open to the idea that they might be a year or two away here. They don't need to be so aggressive to fill in every single need on this team. And hey, let some of these young players play and develop as well. Now, before we dive into the roster breakdown, I do want to talk about this coaching staff, uh, kind of how they stack up against the rest of the league and what this team is going to look like schematically this year. And I find myself to be at least somewhat of a Dennis Allen apologist, not necessarily in the sense of like, I'm going to pound the table and be like, he is their head coach of the future, or even that I would sit here and say that he doesn't really deserve to be on the hot seat. I thought if they fired him last year, I, I would have understood the thinking I have him ranked as the 25th head coach in the league. It's not like I'm, again, pounding the table for him, but I do think he's underrated in the sense that I do believe Dennis Allen is one of the premium defensive minds in the league. If you look at those rankings there for pass and run defense coaching, I mean, I've got him in the top six for pass defense coaching with an A- minus grade, very respectable for run defense as well ranking with a B grade, 11th to 16th. And I'll just reiterate, like I think between how how good he is at scheming his defense paired with the continuity that they've been allowed to have, at least on the defensive side of the ball, this is one of the better coached defenses in the league. And they were good yet again last year, despite injuries and quite frankly, not the most talented roster. And I think the Saints held on to him for that reason. He is really good at, it, at what he does. He is a premium defensive coordinator in my mind. I view him very similarly to like maybe Steve Spagnolo on the high end down to like, a, you know, a, a Vic Fangio or maybe what we're seeing with Jeff Fisher in Cleveland where it's like he's a premium defensive coordinator, but there might be a little bit of something missing in terms of is this guy a head coach? And that, that goes beyond the typical criticisms of having a defensive head coach, which are relevant. And as we've seen, a lot of defensive head coach teams just have a certain limit when you don't have that offensive guru in an offensive league to take command from an X's and O's standpoint on that side of the ball. You're willingly accepting the fact that you're not going to have that specific advantage that a lot of the great teams in the NFL do have. So that's working here, but it's more than that, too, like to the point of is Dennis Allen good at the CEO aspects of being a head coach at orchestrating that top down dis business plan for the team, developing that chemistry and synergy between both sides of the ball and, you know, having that internal leadership. Is this a guy that the players show up for meetings on a Monday morning after a tough loss and get galvanized by his plan of attack? for the entire team that I think is kind of where Dennis Allen does leave a lot to be desired and kind of ultimately what leaves him on the hot seat. But it is kind of tough for the saints. Cause I do believe there were four or five teams that were looking for defensive coordinators back in January that were glued in on the saints to be like, man, are they going to let Dennis Allen go? Because you know, if you're the Packers or the Eagles, you have an offensive mind, a head coach, can you recreate what the Chiefs have done with a Steve Spagnolo, a failed head coach who's actually a defensive genius? That, to me, is, is Dennis Allen's premium role, and it's hard for the Saints to kind of 
willingly lose that guy because that's not how it works in the NFL. And in, in an ideal situation, you could go to Dennis and be like, hey, we want an offensive-minded head coach. This isn't really working with you at the top. Can you please just step back down and be the great DC that you were for us for five or six years or however long it was? Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. So for the Saints, he is an asset for that side of the ball, and it's it's just more of a matter of like when is the right time to make that transition and maybe he stuns and the saints overachieve and all that but it's just it definitely feels like this is heading towards you know getting that offensive coach getting into the new regime the new era at some point but as far as for this team they to me have one of the premium defensive minds that is going to elevate this team on that side of the ball and let's talk about why that is like what he does schematically that is so good the thing I love about the Saints is in a league that has gone towards two high structures, quarters defense, soft, squishy, bend, don't break defenses, the Saints have stayed very aggressive, very physical, in a lot of ways very traditional, while also adapting a lot of you know modern principles, especially in terms of like pattern matching zones and you know, having that flexibility to get into cover three and quarters and, you know, cover two, which they run really well, having some of that flexibility and having those rules in place to play that stuff, but also the ability to blitz, play man coverage, press, get in your face, dictate things at the line of scrimmage, and don't let the offense dictate to you how they want to attack you. So, I just, I really appreciate that about the Saints, and that's the direction the league is getting back towards. We're seeing this exodus of the sort of quarters Fangio style systems and more of an emphasis towards really Saints Chiefs style defenses. So you're going to get a lot of kind of base 4 2, as you do with the rest of the league, basically. Um, but it, when they do want to go into like more base personnel with four defensive backs on the field, Dennis Allen's really nifty in terms of one week you might see a lot of three four. The next week they might go, you know, six one stuff. They might go to four three stuff. They love that four three over front where the extra outside backer is walking up on the line of scrimmage where it's basically a you know five two, aka a three four base front they really mix things up their game plan for very specific opponents which is becoming more of a rarity these days a good defensive coordinator that can just look at your opponent that week and know what types of fronts and what types of you know schemes to run against them just to, to shut stuff down so very good on early down stuff and then you know third down like i said a lot of man coverage a lot of press They'll blitz five, really, when they need to. A lot of good linebacker blitzes where you don't know which linebacker's coming. They'll blitz the slot corner, but not a ton. And they'll get into, like, you know, loops and stunts and TE stunts and all that stuff occasionally as a changeup. But they're not overly dependent on it either like some teams can be. So just very versatile, very well coached, very adaptable. And I just, this is one of my favorite most well-run defensive schemes in the league. And then he does have Joe Woods as technically the defensive coordinator under him. I, I can't give Joe Woods too much credit. It was a, a complete disaster when he took over as the defensive coordinator in Cleveland. He comes from a variety of different influences. Leslie Frazier, probably more consistent with the types of schemes that you're seeing here with Dennis Allen, but that kind of three, four attacking blitz style defense with Wade Phillips. And then some of that kind of quarters pattern matching zone heavy stuff that Robert Sala likes to run in San Francisco, but hard to say exactly what Joe Woods is good at after what we saw in Cleveland, but I do think is a charismatic guy for the locker room and, and probably good at some other stuff not related to X's and O's that help out in terms of defensive coaching. But then on the offensive side of things, they say goodbye to Pete Carmichael, bring in Clint Kubiak. And, you know, I'm not going to really spend too much time in terms of was this an upgrade? You know, is he going to do an amazing job or anything like that? You know, we've seen Clint Kubiak. Um, he got his chance in Minnesota. It was hit or miss, um, just as it's been hit or miss with Pete Carmichael. So, 
in terms of ranking this group or saying is this some significant upgrade i'm not trying to talk down on the hiring i think it's fine but i'm not gonna be like oh my god they got their guy either you know what i'm saying so like they rank with a c grade both in terms of pass game coaching and run game coaching towards the sort of bottom third of the league there um but more so in terms of like a scheme change it's certainly gonna be here um kubiak absolutely obviously he comes from the kubiak shanahan system wants to live and die from wide zone play action as the base of this offense just as seemingly two-thirds of the league are basing out of this offense what will be interesting to see is that even since clint was calling plays in minnesota uh, about three years ago the league has really changed and gotten substantially better at defending wide zone and defending play action and that's why we've seen um well at least wide zone play action is still as effective as it ever has been causing all sorts of problems around the league but you know we have seen a lot of these teams like san francisco the la rams the cleveland browns with you know clint kubiak was under kevin stefanski who had to go through some of these um you know learning moments in cleveland of shifting away from wide zone a little bit more as teams defended that scheme so well um you know clint's gonna have to show that basically he learned in san francisco that there are literally counter punches you can run counter off of wide zone you can run power and trap and gap stuff you know and and use that um as a threat to set up play action all in the same so i am curious to see what he learned under kyle shanahan last year he can't just come out and run his dad's playbook from 2008 um but um you know i'm, I'm at least open to the idea that this is going to be a really good hire for the saints that at 37 years old i mean he was really young when he kind of got that big shot in in minnesota you know i'm open to the idea that this could be this team's um you know let's let's call it bobby slowick um being hired for the texans or dave canales going in this division to the bucks like you know when you have that defensive head coach it's 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 always exciting if you can stick a younger, you know, more modern thinking offensive mind that Pete Carmichael just wasn't that guy, quite clearly. He's very unproven, hence the C grades, but I, I think the thinking of this hire is very sound. The potential is very high, and I would even go as far as saying, like, if he's amazing, is this the first team that finally does the thing I've been talking about for years where you say goodbye to your defensive head coach and promote your offensive coordinator to head coach instead of losing that guy and having to start all over again. Would be curious if if maybe the Saints would be a forward, forward thinking oper, um forward yeah, forward uh, thinking operation that would do something like that. But there is your 2024 Saints coaching staff. It's a it's a solid if not unspectacular crew running the show here for the saints and now we're going to get into the roster we're going to break down every position group in depth how they stack up against the rest of the league but before we do that i do want to thank the sponsor for today's video underdog fantasy uh, look we're approaching july here and that means we are really getting towards fantasy draft season and i know i'm certainly getting that itch again and that's where i just love having underdog fantasy available to me because yeah, I mean, it's great. You can do best ball drafts and get a chance to, you know, compete for huge payouts. And that's the point of it all, right? But something I like about Underdog, too, is, you know, this is good prep for your home leagues. You can do a $2 entry that, again, gives you a chance at payouts and to get in these competitions and stuff. But you get to see how other people are drafting. When can you get your favorite sleepers? They They act as mock drafts that you can also win money off of as well. And I certainly had leagues that I had drafted back in June just, you know, while I was waiting at the airport or whatever that ended up winning and, and winning me money when the season was done. Because with best ball, it's draft and forget it. All they'll, you know, they'll do is you, your, your lineups, your rosters are set. There's no waivers, no trades. And every week they're going to set your best possible lineup. So all it is is the draft, which is the best part of fantasy football. So if you want to 
have that option to go do your best ball drafts right now, take your knowledge from this series. And, you know, we're all NFL diehards if you're watching this video. So, you know, you want to get those sleepers before the casuals come in and start over drafting the guys you like in the 10th, 11th round. Well, you know, get, get those guys right now. You can take out your phone. You can draft today. You can sign up using promo code TFG or scan that QR code on the screen. Underdog will match up to $250 on your first deposit, and you will support my channel in a big, big way in the process. So go check that out at Underdog Fantasy. Let's talk about these Saints and if there might be some values to be found in those fantasy drafts for this team. Now, unfortunately, I, I don't think that the quarterback room with Derek Carr is where that value is going to come from. I, I mean, what is there truly to say about Derek Carr at this point? I mean, just go click on my Saints deep dive from last year, drop the you know audio in, same analysis. Take the 2017 Raiders deep dive. Same deal. He's Derek Carr. He's the current Andy Dalton line in the NFL, which is funny given the quarterback he replaced that I suggested that they should probably just stick with instead of giving Derek Carr $140 million. Um, but, you know, he's the guy where he's too good to lose with and get you a good draft pick and transition you to the next era of your team. And he's too bad to win with, which is what we saw last year and what we've seen for years and years and years with the Raiders. He's, you know, got adequate tools. He has a good arm, if not an overrated arm at times. I think there's this belief that he has a cannon for an arm. He has a good NFL arm, but it's, you know, it's not some piss missile attached to his shoulder blade. He makes, for the most part, good decisions, but he's not a surgeon he misses reads, you know, he makes mistakes. He puts the ball in harm's way. He's not anything close to an elite processor. I would argue that's the biggest gap between Derek, Go Derek Carr and like Jared Goff or Kirk Cousins right now is how well he processes information, um, you know, makes good reads versus making mistakes. He's just a tick behind some of those guys like Cousins and Goff and, and maybe a Prescott. Certainly changing coordinators, changing schemes, again, isn't going to fix that. And that's part of the thing with Derek Carr. Is he's, he's a coach killer because you always think he'll be a little bit better. And then people just blame the coordinator. That's kind of what happened last year in a lot of ways. But honestly, the, the thing that bothers me the most about Derek Carr, and I think has perpetually held him back, and I've talked about this for years and years and years with Carr, and I tried to warn Saints fans about this last year, um, I think they, you know, I had Saints fans literally tagging me throughout the year. Like, you were so right about how timid of a passer Derek Carr is. He is the kind of least brave, least creative, perhaps most robotical starter in the league. He has absolutely no sense of how the pocket is breaking down around him when he has time to stand in the pocket and get through his reads, when he can extend the play, get out of the pocket. Because when he does scramble, when he does get out of the pocket, he actually makes stuff happen. But his inability to consistently know where those escape lanes are when he should run, because you do see him just bail out of clean pockets very consistently, because he's got a he's got a clock in the back of his mind. He's like, okay, two seconds. I'm probably about to get sacked. He doesn't feel that. He just assumes, and you end up leaving so much meat on the bones uh, as a quarterback when that's your style. And it also leads to just a frustrating amount of third and seven. We're making a read. It's not wide open. Okay, I'm throwing the check down. I'm throwing the crossing route five yards short of the sticks. And it's like, okay, by the book, yes, that's what your read tells you you're supposed to do. But situational football matters, and the, the better quarterbacks, not even the elite quarterbacks, but the better quarterbacks know, like, situationally, that's not what we want. We got to get a first down. We got to find a better look that will move the sticks. And with Derek Carr, he is entirely a product of the system of what the play call is, if guys are open, if guys are open early, and how good his pass protection is. So for all those reasons, I just, I was so uninspired when the Saints signed him. It was the definition of like, man, just be bad for a year. 
you know, signing Derek Carr is is not going to get you anywhere. And here we are, second year of Derek Carr. It's like, yeah, I mean, they have a quote unquote top twenty quarterback. He won't be a whole lot better than that. Won't be a whole lot worse. He will help you compete. If everything is perfect around you, you might win ten or eleven games. And you know, Derek Carr has never won a playoff game in his career, but maybe you could get one. But it's like, dude, this is not going to get you anywhere other than the 14th pick in the draft and a harder crack at a, at a quarterback. So, like I said, it's it's an exhausted conversation at this point. I don't think anybody really wants me to keep going down this path. Um, we know what he is, and it's time to talk about the rest of the team because that's really all that matters when a guy like Derek Carr is your quarterback. In terms of the backup, I do think this year it will be Jake Hayner as QB2. It was a fourth-round pick last year out of uh, Fresno State. You know, has the look and feel of an NFL backup. We didn't get to see him last year, um, but I, I think he could be a, you know, kind of like a Bailey Zappi type, someone that could steal you a win here or there, you know, make some right reads if you scheme up a good play um, or, or scheme up a good game he can execute. But you know, I, I think as far as this year is concerned, they'll lean towards that. Um, especially if it was a week or two. You know, if, if Derek Carr were to unfortunately go down for like an extended period of time, they might go to Spencer Rattler just to kind of see what he could look like for a longer period of time. Um, but I do think the thinking with Spencer Rattler is and should be is make him QB3 for this year. Give him a full year to like you know, fully decompress, learn the system, you know, follow Derek Carr, you know, go through the motions. And then really year two is his rookie year, like a total red shirt year. Um, because he is a rather raw quarterback prospect. Um, but what is cool about Spencer Rattler is that he's not the, he's not as raw as he was the first years at Oklahoma, right? Like he was a, someone that, was a projected like first overall pick once upon a time. Highly recruited guy was following in the shoes of guys like Kyler Murray, Baker Mayfield, Jalen Hurts, this QB factory that was Lincoln Riley and the Oklahoma Sooners. And uh, just didn't work out for Rattler, but he had to go through a humbling, maturing process on and off the field. And when he went to South Carolina, he had to kind of win the locker room over, win the coaching staff over. And it's like what happened with Bo Nix, very similar, like he was at Auburn, running around, backyard football, had to go to Oregon, and his game matured. Very similar with Spencer Rattler, excuse me, but on a much, you know, if Bo Nix is 100% of that narrative, Rattler was at like 65%, right, where he did miss a lot more reads than someone like Bo Nix did, and, um, you know, the processing, the decision-making Still has a long ways to go, but he started to avoid mistakes. He played in structure much better. And you could still see like the traits in there that made him um, get some of that hype to be a potential number one pick. He's got a very live arm. He doesn't have a missile of an arm, but a very live arm. He's twitchy. He can run around. He can make stuff happen. There are traits to like. I would argue he's a more traitsy quarterback than anybody on this roster. Um, but it's just a matter of can the mental side of things come along. So even if things would be more explosive and he might even be a better quarterback than Jake Hayner is, I certainly had a higher grade on Spencer Rattler coming out than I did on Jake Hayner, hence the higher grade there. We haven't seen either guy play at the NFL level. But um, even if they feel like Rattler is a little bit higher upside if he were to play this year, I think they'll do what a lot of teams do and, and just kind of give him the full red shirt season unless it was a situation where Carr goes down week eight for the season and they need a dart throw at upside, right? But I did like the pick as a fifth round flyer, very similar to me to like Matt Corral. Now, obviously that didn't work, work out for Washington, but you, you saw some flashes for a fifth round pick. You know, you're you're looking for that jackpot, that Dak Prescott pick, you know, for a guy with some traits that can um, eventually become the starter. And and even if he doesn't become like the future franchise of the Saints, I think even if he kind of like Corral was in Washington, granted they didn't really have a guy as good as Derek Carr, but 
you know, there is a world where they like what they saw from Rattler. They head into next year and want to just let Spencer Rattler kind of get a chance, but also be, in a lot of ways, a bridge quarterback. Very similar to the Matt Corral story. Um, so definitely a name you're going to want to know. I think we will eventually see him play for the Saints, most likely next season. Um, but I like the pick in the sense of it's it's very consistent with this kind of narrative and this idea that they are looking for avenues to kind of get away from Derek Carr and start to think about new regimes, new eras of this New Orleans Saints and um, Saints team. And, and I think Rattler was a, a logical pick to, to potentially get them there. And then, hey, you still got Nathan Peterman kicking around for all of the memes about how bad he's supposed to be. The guy keeps getting jobs. I'm just going to say that. Uh, we'll give him that. Um, but, yeah, 20th at quarterback. Let's move on to hopefully some more encouraging and exciting conversations for this Saints team. And, you know, I, I think this wide receiver room can be that for this team. It's it's not the most incredible room. It's still in a lot of ways unproven. I have them ranked, um, you know, with a B-minus grade. 19th to 24th so it's a very good room but it's nothing insane yet um, but all these guys do make sense together and all have potential um, big potential really within their role and you can kind of say that about Chris Olave like I'm not going to say there's questions about Chris Olave I think he's shown that at worst he is a 1b or um, to put it in, in maybe a more positive way phrase if he's your best wide receiver and the rest of things fill out that can be great you know what i'm saying like you don't have to have a justin jefferson if you have a chris olave and really good complementary pieces maybe something like i would say mike evans chris godwin that duo together maybe like a tyler lockett dk metcalf duo something in that breath i think olave can be one of those dudes but I, I do think unproven in the sense of, like, can he actually be a little bit more than that? I think Olave has gotten off to a very fast start, despite some questionable quarterback play. Let's face it, even in the like first half of last, last season, Derek Carr was not good at all. Got better as the year went on. Um, built a really good connection with Chris Olave, actually. Um, but, you know, 2022, his rookie season with Andy Dalton and that whole mess... The fact that he's shown to be the guy we just described as a, as a 1A, 1B type of wide receiver um, already is impressive. But can he actually take that next leap and be something like a Devontae Adams or C.D. Lamb, you know, like that true alpha? I didn't think I would reach that point with Chris Olave coming out, his frame and his kind of lack of play strength and and really what I felt was a lack of elite speed was going to kind of hold him back from that sort of potential but I've I've kind of changed my opinion on that he's actually shown some of the highs of a player like that in my opinion I think his deep speed is phenomenal frankly better than I remember seeing at Ohio State and even some of the tough catches he's made through traffic concentration catches it wasn't something I remembered being his game at Ohio State. So if he's able to, you know, do what he does now where that's coming in flashes and crank it up a little bit to the point that he's doing it more consistently, that is an area where I think guys like CeeDee Lamb and Devontae Adams did reach a point in year three, year four, where those areas of their game did take that leap. I'm not going to completely write off the idea that Chris Olave could be one of those dudes. But again, he doesn't have to be. Um, it's more of a compliment to him and what he's accomplished so far to suggest the idea that he might. It does remind me a little bit as well of like Calvin Ridley around this stage in his career before the kind of fall off of Calvin Ridley. There's a lot of Falcons fans that said, hey, he's a number one. And then in time, it showed like, well, he just doesn't quite have that play strength aspect of the position that does matter to reach that true alpha tier. Um, but yeah, man, he's certainly good enough to be this team's number one. And I would, I would also be remiss if I didn't point out the fact that he is one of the five to 10 best route runners in the NFL already in terms of pacing his routes, his 
acceleration, the stop start ability, the foot speed. It's it's all spectacular. That's not a surprise. That's what we did see at Ohio State. But um, we do want to at least emphasize that that's what he does best and um, has, has really set him up for success early in his career in terms of being one of those premium separators. But he is clearly a cornerstone piece for this team and is doing a lot of the heavy lifting with this team ranking as a B minus because I mean, honestly, the rest of this group is, is pretty unproven, you know, Rashid Shahid, I want to like him more than I do. I, I really do. Um, some of the explosive highlight plays he makes get you so excited because his speed, even the way he can track the ball, he doesn't have drop issues. We all love that guy that can take the top off the defense and, you know, make you pay if you get into single high or if you go quarters and, um, you know, rotate the, the wrong way and leave the, you know, top off the defense, he'll, he can kill you. And he has shown that, uh, I, I don't want to say occasionally, but it's not every week that he makes you pay for it. But for me, it's like, can they find a way in this, you know, play action shot, um, you know, style offense to really tap into the threat of him over the top. And I, I do believe Shahid can be one of the best true deep threats in the NFL. But there has been a little bit of something missing with Rashid Shahid. Not in the sense of like he's bad or anything close to that, but in the sense of like, can he take that next step to be more of a mainstay for this offense and, and a consistent weapon? You know, there are times where, you know, if you're going to be a deep threat, it's really important to have the ability to throttle down, stop, work underneath, work on the timing routes with your quarterback to, um, you know, sit down, run a comeback, that kind of stuff so that uh, defenses can't just play way off. And some of those timing throws, you do see miscommunications with Rashid Shahid where he's just not quite where Derek Carr was expecting him to be. You also are talking about a guy that just does not have or hasn't shown to have a diversified route tree. It's, you know, slants, posts, goes, and they're still working on the comeback aspect of it, but not a guy that you're really going to move into the slot and threaten in a whole bunch of different ways. And, um, you know, when you are that one-dimensional, it's going to make you a little bit more inconsistent and less of a factor for the team. But for a dude that this team found undrafted, out of Weber State, he is a weapon. And I almost feel like the way I've broken him down has been a little bit um, negative. But maybe that's because I really do like him and would love to see him more uh, become a little bit more than just, you know, certified deep threat. You know what I'm saying? So I would love to see that leap. I don't know that we're necessarily going to get it. I think there is some potential in there. I'm not quite confident enough that we see it that I'm going to put the up arrow on him like I am on um, some other guys. I think the most likely scenario is that he's a good number three piece, something kind of like a Darius Slayton, Darnell Mooney type of deep threat for the team, which is which is a useful third. Um, but they're going to need another guy to step up as the number two, right? If that's if that's going to be where Shahid settles in here. Also, change the number, dude. It's 22 is not it. You're not a running back. Beyond him, I think this team is is kind of low-key counting on a year two leap from A.T. Perry, who was a really exciting day three pick that went way later than he should have um, and showed a lot of exciting flashes as well in his rookie season. This is a, a six-foot-four like sub 200 pound wide receiver. So he's like tall and lanky, but he wins tough catches. He's, you know, a lot of these six, four wide receivers are 210, 215 pounds. And AT Perry, isn't that he's a little bit more lanky, but he does that. So he can have better foot speed, run better routes and separate a little bit more. So you, you're, you've got a really unique type of wide receiver here that, um, can actually do a lot more than just be like a contested catch, big bodied wide receiver. And he ended up, you know, getting out there late in the season on 18 targets 
came down with 12 receptions for 246 yards, four touchdowns, uh, four for six on contested catch looks. He showed up, man. And I think with what they saw from him in the in the last kind of third of the season, they were willing to look at this and be like, you know what, let's let's see what A.T. Perry can do in a starting role. And, and if he can continue to grow into his game as a – man, um, I would just say like a reduced version of T. Higgins – because T. Higgins is similar in the sense that he can actually run some routes and, and cause some separation as a big guy. Um, has has good speed, not like great speed. The the sort of like skill sets are like the strengths and weaknesses are the same. It's just T. Higgins is cranked up 130%. But if he can be that role in this offense, maybe like uh, Cortland Sutton, maybe to throw a name out there, to be a bigger bodied complement to Chris Olave, you're really talking. And, and, I I struggle with A.T. Perry because it's just the odds are against him. He falls in the draft and, you know, wasn't this overly productive player in college. There's been that lack of production. Um, but you can't really explain it away for any good reason. He's he's smart. He's a good route runner. Tough hands. Like, everything you'd like to see. So it's hard to say that he can't break out this year. You know what I'm saying? So... He's exciting. I'm excited to see his look. And if you're talking about where's the value in this group, you know, A.T. Perry in the last round of your fantasy drafts, you know, if he catches 10 touchdowns this year, 800 yards on 60 catches, I don't I don't think that's wild, especially when, you know, you look at Olave and Shahid. They're both six foot, 180 pounds, you know, like they're not they're not those big kind of go get it wide receivers that Derek Carr really likes. Like, remember Michael Crabtree? Maybe that's a good comp for A.T. Perry. Crabtree had to have had a season there where he caught 14 touchdowns. I, I just looked it up. He actually had 12 in San Francisco in, in 2012, um, but had 9, 8, and 8 in his three years with Derek Carr. So that's like, you know, a skill set that I, I think Derek Carr really works well with back shoulders, jump balls, fades, Perry can be that guy. So probably too much time spent at this point on wide receiver three, but um, he would be, if I were a Saints fan, he, he'd be one of the guys that I'm looking for. Like, can he please just have that breakout year and you have a group here that you're really excited about? Because then you have your your do-it-all Chris Olave, your deep threat in Shahid, your big-bodied kind of calm short to intermediate weapon, uh, and your sideline weapon in A.T. Perry. I spend so much time talking about complementary skill sets and having a group that makes sense and has that synergy together. That could be this trio right here. Just need a little bit more provenness about it. Um, but in terms of the ancillary weapons at tight end, you've really got three guys that are going to be a, a part of a rotation. And I do think we see a lot more 12 personnel um, being more of this Shanahan 12, you know, play action wide zone style offense. And certainly a shift in kind of how these guys have been used and what we think about them. And let's start with Jawan Johnson. I have, a, you know, kind of a hand in hand conversation here because the film from last year on Jawan Johnson was jaw dropping. He, he made some catches, ran some routes that I just, I, I knew he was solid, but man, there were shades of like Delaney Walker in there with Jawan Johnson, who's now in what year three year four of this tight end conversion project after being a wide receiver at Oregon, he's really settled in. And in my opinion, he has some of the strongest hands. Like if you're just running a slant or a back shoulder, his combination of body control and, and the arm strength and the grip strength to just stretch his arms out, pluck a ball, win a catch in traffic, not necessarily like elevating for some crazy jump ball. He can do that, but not necessarily like a, you know, sensational leaping catch, but just those tough catches in traffic, he's dominant at that. And from week 10 onward in last season, he was 8 for 10 on contested catches. So it shows up on the stat sheet as well. Um, so I like the player as that sort of wide receiver, tight end hybrid, that big slot, you know, in, in this Saints offense in a lot of ways, stuff that Michael Thomas does well, I don't think it's a coincidence. He he saw an uptick in targets when Thomas got injured in the second half of the year. He delivered there. Um, I think of like Marcus Colston. 
that's that's Jawan Johnson. But that's a good transition to more of like the negative side of this, which isn't even against Jawan Johnson. It's more of just with the scheme change here, his role is going to change, I think. You know, Pete Carmichael was, was still very much running those Sean Payton-inspired offenses where you had those names, guys like Colston and Jimmy Graham. Peyton was the guy that had the vision for Jawan Johnson to switch to big slot, basically. Um, now you're going to get more of that under center, 12 personnel. You want guys playing close to the line of scrimmage. And it's not that Jawan Johnson can't be productive, but the number of those speed outs, the stick routes, the slants, the high volume share that he got in the second half of the year last year, that's going to go down. You're going to much more be looking at more of like a Jonu Smith, Gerald Everett type of role where he's probably getting two or three targets a game as a rotational tight end in 12 personnel where he's out there running crossing routes and trying to get him lost on play action, get him run after catch opportunities. The undersized tight end in those types of offenses has a role, but it's usually not a hyper-consistent, hyper-productive role. Now, I still think they'll put him out there in true passing situations. They'll find ways to use him, but the consistent th the consistency that we saw from him at the end of the year, I just don't think from a fantasy football angle is going to be there. So I like the player, but I have some questions in terms of how the usage is going to work with the system changing here. And he's probably a guy that is going to be getting a little overdrafted based on what he did for a different staff last year that I'm not quite buying, especially because I think we see a little bit more Foster Moreau, um, not just for the scheme reasons where he is more of that full-size tight end that they don't have on this roster, by the way, because it's Jawan Johnson and Taysom Hill are the other two tight ends. So Foster Moreau is the inline dude that all of these you know, wide zone offenses want that guy that can, you know, hinge block a D end, you know, reach block a, a, a D end, be that critical blocker on the end. And and Moreau has been a hit or miss blocker throughout his career, but he is he's better than Jawan Johnson and Taysom Hill. So for that reason, I think we see more playing time for Moreau, but also he's another year removed from the um, cancer recovery. We weren't sure if he was going to be able to play for the Saints last year. Um, some tough news came out uh, around this time last year after they had just signed him or agreed to sign him. Then the news came out, and then they still proceeded with the signing. Um, you know, fortunately for him, he was able to – I don't want to speak too firmly on what it was, um, but I believe it was it was cancer. I, I believe he got cleared of it and then got back on the football, pretty, uh, football field pretty quickly last year. But that's obviously a tough road to recovery, and it's very reasonable to think that he wasn't – 100% last year coming off of that. So I, I do like Foster Moreau. I liked him returning to um, New Orleans and, and where he played at LSU. And he was always buried behind Darren Waller with the Raiders. He's got that familiar with Derek uh, familiarity with Derek Carr. And um, I do think Moreau is going to play and play a role with this offense and, and very likely eat into Jawan Johnson's snaps and playing time. And then you have Taysom Hill, who... I mean, let's be honest, if you're talking about give me a wing tight end who's really good at climbing to the second level, blocking linebackers, finding a safety on wide zone, but also being a nasty threat on a crossing route or wide leak where he gets lost on the backside, nasty after the catch, Taysom Hill's honestly better in that role than Jawan Johnson. So... If this team's going to be more of a 12 personnel Shanahan style team, I think they might look at this and be like, our best 12 personnel is actually Moreau is the Y and Taysom Hill is that F wing player. And then that kind of leaves Jawan Johnson as what back to wide receiver as a blocker on the perimeter. It's a good spot for him, but um, it's, it's going to be an interesting thing to see how the, um, scheme change impacts these guys' production. But that said, you have a little bit of everything in that room, and I actually think it's a it's a very good, balanced, tight end room. There's no superstar in there, um, but all these guys can play their role and do it pretty well. And then you also got to keep an eye on Dallin Holker, another undersized dude, 
as we broke down, there's really no room for him with Jawan Johnson and Taysom Hill. Um, but a year or two down the road, this dude at Colorado State was just a, a, a sensational football player. Undersized, didn't test well, small level of competition, but was a huge weapon for Colorado State. Caught everything, super instinctive dude, loved his tape, couldn't believe he went undrafted. So really good pickup for the Saints just from a talent perspective. And um, definitely down the road, if you're looking for a wing tight end, a tight end too that can play from the slot, um, he could be a, be a dude. Now, I, I know I never got to the wide receiver depth, but let's just continue down this path of the ancillary weapons and then circle back to the wide receiver depth. Um, so you do still have Alvin Kamara, who had a mini resurgence last year. He didn't get back to being the elite top you know, premium wide receiver back that he once was. You know, this dude was once upon a time in the debate with like Christian McCaffrey for who's the best receiving back in the game. You know, his consistency in terms of contact balance on screens to turn dump downs into 12, 15, 20 yard gains, the consistency in which he did that, it, it used to be, you know, Hall of Fame level. Um, he's still good at those things. He still has those smooth hands. He has those easy transitions after the catch where, you know, it feels like he's one of the exceptions to, like, don't take your eyes off the ball before you turn up field. He seems like one of those guys that can just naturally kind of ease the ball into his motion while he looks at where those second-level defenders are coming from. He's got those instincts out in space. He's a, he's a good route runner, but he doesn't quite have that quick twitch um, with his age, with the injuries stacking up over the years, doesn't quite have that ability to go out on an option route and, you know, break a linebacker's ankles. He can still win on those routes, but it's just everything's been turned down a little bit with Alvin Kamara. But with where he was coming into the year, coming off a down season, entering a year where he was going to get suspended, um, I was I was really thinking this was kind of the beginning of the end for him. That this that last year was going to be his last year and. Again, he had a mini reemergence, and he's still a very useful player in all those areas we described, um, and helps kind of fill out this this group in terms of the backups behind him. Jamal Williams, a very high effort pass blocker, um, will get snaps on third down for that reason. Very sure hands, um, catching the ball out of the backfield, but just not a dynamic athlete. And then Kendra Miller is the guy to keep an eye on. He is the guy with the juice in this room. Year two out of TCU is a third round pick. Missed a lot of time in his rookie year. Um, I was lower on Kendra Miller, but certainly as a you know third down back and and someone that can do so, you know similar stuff that Alvin Kamara has done throughout his career. I think he can turn into a better route runner than he was at TCU and, and develop better hands and, and more usefulness in the receiving game. All that stuff. I, I think it's a a good mentor, at least on the field, to have in Alvin Kamara um, to learn some of that stuff from. And, and in time, like I think Alvin Kamara is like a $29 million cap hit next season or something ridiculous. He's not going to see that money, obviously. So if, if this is Kamara's last year in New Orleans, I think Miller could get there to be a very useful back. And then you also have James Robinson here. Uh, yes, that James Robinson, uh, who has been a productive receiving back at least in his prime. Um, but we do need to circle back to the wide receiver depth. It is, I would say, a deeper room than they had last year. They bring in some vets that have played. Cedric Wilson was, I guess, because he doesn't run 4-3. Mike McDaniel very quickly just forgot he existed. Um, but you go back, you know, the last time he was a, a starter in Dallas, he was a really useful third wide receiver. And if, you know... A.T. Perry gets six weeks into the season and something is missing there, you know, whatever it might be, Cedric Wilson can step in and be that third wide receiver on the outside. I, I think Miami kind of late last season remembered that Cedric Wilson existed and you saw the same guy that is like he's a balanced build, balanced route runner, really good at making that first guy miss after the catch. They gave him a three-year, $22 million well-earned contract in Miami and then again just forgot he existed so there's really no reason to believe he can't be that guy again so I like that signing to kind of get him as like a post-hype cheap 
nothing burger. I think it was like a two year, four million dollar contract, maybe. So really good depth. And then Equinemius St. Brown as a wide receiver five. Yeah, sure. Why not? Um, hasn't had the best quarterback play in Chicago, but he'll block on the perimeter and, you know, he can fill out your depth chart. That's all I'm going to say on him. And then uh, Bub Means was an interesting day three pick. More insurance for that vertical threat in this offense. If Rashid Shahid doesn't hit, you get another good dart throw on a guy in Bub Means who was a uh, Bit of a late breakout at Pittsburgh. Another guy that, you know, if you're a deep threat and you have bad quarterback play, it's it's tough to live in that world. Um, but there's a lot to like in Bub Means from the size, the speed, the toughness. Wouldn't be the biggest surprise in the world if if he hit in this economy where, you know, you do find guys like Rashid Shahid and A.T. Perry late that can contribute for you. Um, so I think that's probably their six. I don't see Stanley Morgan or the other two undrafted free agents making this team. But uh, it's it's nice to have a couple guys um, that have played and, and can step in for a game or two and um, not derail the whole offense there. So uh, I do like the group of weapons. It's a B minus group right now. If this ended up, you know, climbing up to being more of a top half group in the league as the year goes on and things go well for the Saints, uh, I could see it and I could see this being a source of optimism for this Saints team overall. But there's also a, you know, maybe possible but less likely world where. You're heading into next year, and it's Chris Olave and nobody else. So just going to have to see how this plays out. But let's talk a little bit more about the running backs in terms of the actual running game. And we'll we'll start with Alvin Kamara there. You know, I, I think there was a clear drop-off in juice with Kamara in terms of the speed, the ability to hit a hole, to generate some pop at the you know in the pads, fight for tough yardage. It, it, it just everything with, with with Alvin Kamara has been cranked down 15, 20 percent. And it, it is what it is. He's had a high workload. It happens with these running backs, but still has great contact balance. I think his vision is it, it's solid to good. It's never been the biggest strength in his game is crazy patience and seeing holes open up that a lot of backs wouldn't. It's just, you know, it's never been the first thing you celebrate with Alvin Kamara. It just hasn't. So he's he's an adequate runner at this point. Still can get the job done, though, and and is is basically the, the key cog here that I do think it's a solid workload. They'll sprinkle in some Jamal Williams on short yardage stuff. They'll sprinkle in Kendra Miller um, to kind of see what they have there for the future. But with Kamara kind of being the primary back here, I, I do leave this as a C-plus ranked running back room that is in that tier that we've we've had a lot of these teams lower in the rankings where these are groups that will allow you to do what you want to do but aren't necessarily going to lift the run game up either. And I don't really know how much more time we need to spend on this group. You know, Jamal Williams very much is what he is. Love his energy in the locker room. If it's third and one, I, I love giving the ball to Jamal Williams. I don't really love him in a whole lot of other situations, though, because – He's one of these guys that, like, if you get a well-blocked run, his speed can be overrated. But with Jamal Williams, it's like he is literally, and again, unless he's fighting for a yard or two, after five yards, he is literally getting you exactly what was blocked up. There's just not any juice or speed or explosiveness there. But it can be nice, you know, if Kamara's had four carries and you need a tough first down, he he trucks through a guy for a tough first down, keeps the chains going, and then he gets up and does one of his crazy celebrations. It can spark some life into your entire offense to see that energy come in. So he's he's a useful player, but um, you know, feels, feels a very specific role for this team. And then yeah, Kendra Miller, we we talked a little bit about him in the receiving breakdown, but I, I just I didn't see a sort of starting running back with him coming out of TCU. I think he's capable, good jump cut, decent athlete, decent size. I just didn't love his vision. Very bounce happy runner coming out of the Big 12. Even in that, um, he got the one big game in like week 18. He got a bunch of carries, ended up um, having a very productive week 18, which is probably going to lead to some hype for him. But there was a run in that game. My apologies, I, I don't have the highlight on it, but um, where he, you know, is a wide open hole. Could have gotten six yards out of it. Instead, he bounces it. DN tracks him down, and you know 
he, he loses two yards on it. So it's like even in a good game, there was some of those frustrations with him at TCU where it's like, is this going to be a guy that, A, will consistently get you what you need, and, and B, is he going to be a guy that, you know, thinks he's LaShawn McCoy, thinks he's Barry Sanders, thinks he can bounce everything outside and make guys miss, but he gets to the NFL and finds out that you can't do that. I think there's there's some of that in, in Kendra Miller. So I, I'm intrigued because of the, you know, the, there's a clear future opportunity. I would think it's pretty likely that neither Kamara or Jamal Williams are in this backfield next year. And if this team is starting to take a little bit more of a future approach, you have to keep an eye on Kendra Miller, at least from a productivity fantasy football lens in the sense of if this team season goes south or or especially if like Alvin Kamara gets hurt, which has happened more and more as he's gotten older, um, they're not going to just give Jamal Williams this backfield. I think they would really sprinkle in a lot of Kendra Miller. And while I'm not like crazy about him as a prospect, could he be a DeAndre Swift level player or, um, you know, not a good player comparison, but in terms of caliber, like a Brian Robinson, like a decent enough starter. Sure. I I think it's possible. So we'll, we'll see where that goes. You do have James Robinson, not really much of a use for him. He's just like the perfect example of like, when you lose it at this position, you can just totally lose it. And James Robinson never had great top speed, but he had a good first step. He lost that good first step. And then it's like, yeah, he just doesn't really have anything left. Wouldn't be surprised if this team just keeps three running backs, especially when you look at Taysom Hill, who I feel like we kind of undersold him a little bit when we did the receiver breakdown. He's actually, in an unironic way, turned into a weapon for this offense. I think he was underrated in terms of some of the plays he made catching the ball down the field um, and being a tight end slash wide receiver for this team. But he's... um, still a top five rushing threat as a quarterback that they find ways to tap into. So, um, you know, Derek Carr would obviously rank as a nothing burger if we're ranking the quarterback run multiplier, but we have to factor in the fact that they use Taysom Hill seemingly three or four, five, six, seven times a game. Sometimes when things aren't working for them, they just lean into Taysom Hill and be like, fine, we're just going to go wildcat and, he's a guy that can throw the ball. It's been hit or miss when they do, but there's at least enough of a threat that he could throw that defenses have to account for it. And then as a runner, man, like he's um, Josh Allen. Like I don't say that lightly, but he is, he's 230 pounds. He runs with his hair on fire. He, he runs like every play is his last. He runs with power. He's got good vision. He's got a great stiff arm. Um, he's got great speed. He's a hell of a weapon, man. Like, that contract is a joke, and his existence on this team is hilarious. What what, what was it? Um, Didn't Sean Payton once call him Steve Young or something like that? Like, there has been some very funny narratives around Taysom Hill, but you have to find a way to factor in the fact that he actually does produce for this team, and he is a weapon, and that really shows up here in the QB run multiplier where you can't, you know, I, I said he's Josh Allen. I, I believe that in terms of just as a running quarterback, I think there's a lot of parallels there, but um, you know, Josh Allen, for example, is going to rank much higher in terms of the QB run multiplier grade, probably going to be like an a or an a minus or something like that in the top five, you know, you can't give them that full benefit because he's not the starter. You only do it so many times a game, blah, blah, blah. The The surprise factor is a little bit less um, when it's your elite franchise quarterback that can do those types of things. But again, it has to be factored in there. And I, I would argue before we look at the blocking here, he is the highest rated asset that this run game has and is still someone I would be leaning into. Um, it's a real deal. We joke about it, but it's a, it's a real deal when you watch the Saints. There's an impact there, and that needs to be reflected in in a series like this. But um, let's let's transition. And, and what's crazy about Taysom Hill too is like he blocks too. So like he catches the ball, he blocks, he runs. He just 
He's useful, man. I, li- I like him. I've turned into a big Taysom Hill fan throughout the years. Um, but this is where the optimism falls off a cliff for the Saints offense, and that is the offensive line. I have this ranked very close to the bottom, um, tied for 30th for the worst offensive line in the league, 26th to 30th in terms of pass blocking with a C- minus grade there, and then C for run blocking, um, 21st to 30th, a little bit better there, but still a concern. Now, this does come with a huge question mark with Ryan Ramchek. And with Ryan Ramchek, this group has a lot more promise and upside, but it really doesn't feel like that's going to happen. And, you know, there there is a huge mathematical difference between having one weak link and two weak links. You might say, oh, it, it can't be that much of a difference between having one really bad guy and two really bad guys, but it is. This is the offensive line as a unit. So if you go from one weak link giving up a pressure to two weak links, you know, your bad weak link might actually have a good rep at left guard, but then that's the rep where the right tackle trips over his feet and is getting pressured. So again, this stuff compounds very quickly. And um, that's why the Ryan Ramchek uh, injury is, is such a big question mark here. Cause if you're able to put him at right tackle, and then you just have one question mark at left guard where you have all these pieces to kind of figure out who's best at left guard. That's much easier to work with than, okay, we got a rookie left tackle switching positions who wasn't known for his pass protection at Oregon State. And then we have two completely unproven pieces at left guard and right tackle. So that's that's kind of the starting point. But let's go through these guys individually left to right. And, um, you know, I, I like Fuaga. He, he probably wouldn't have been my pick with where they took him. Um, I was higher on guys like Fatanu and, and Amarius Mims. But there, there's nothing in a vacuum wrong with Talise Fuaga or Fuanga in the top half. He is a mauler of a run blocker. He is an aesthetically pleasing product of an offensive line. You know, we can dive into foot speed and technique and pass rush or, you know, pass protection, win rate and all that stuff and all that stuff matters. But sometimes you just want the big 330 pound dude with crazy strength that loves to hit people and loves to play the position. You need some of those guys too. So I I do like them, but I'd be lying if I said I don't have some questions, not, not in terms of run blocking, feel very good about that. And he was one of the best reach blockers for wide zone. You know, if they want to make this shift to have a guy that can seal the edge and turn a corner and help the running back turn the corner, his tape at Oregon State when they did go to wide zone was phenomenal. He was strangely way more athletic doing that than he looked doing everything else. Something about the way he opens up and is able to do those blocks is is really nice. So I get that side of things. But if you're going to be down Ryan Ramchek. And you look at Trevor Penning, who has been a complete flop in terms of pass protection. Is that what you needed, or did you need the guy that was a better pass protector? I think you can beg the question there. Um, Fuanga wasn't anything truly special as a pass protector. He was solid. It was enough where you look at an elite run blocker and a solid pass blocker and said, yeah, that's a first-round tackle prospect, but you know what you're getting there. I do think you're getting a guy that isn't going to get the best depth in terms of protecting the edge, can lose to inside counters, can lose to second reaction pass rush moves where his feet just get a little bit left behind. Also doesn't have the elite length that you typically look for in a tackle. So some of those thresholds in terms of being a consistent lockdown pass protecting left tackle, I I would say it's, it's kind of unlikely that he's ever going to be a great pass protecting tackle. I think he can be an elite run blocking one, right? And that's part of why I said, you know, I I think he'd be a hall of fame guard and just a really good tackle. And then you, you put on top of that, that he's switching positions from right tackle to left tackle in, in this scenario. That is what I've heard is that without Ram check, they're going to put penning over at right and Fuaga at left. Um, Again, to be determined, I don't want to spend too much time on this because they might just say, actually, Penning, state, left tackle, Fuaget, right. So 
we'll just we'll leave it there. But if he is switching to the left side, it adds another question mark to this whole thing. Um, but yeah, I, I think we broke that down pretty well in the sense that you know we set this up where right tackle and left guard are already huge question marks for you. It is far from a guarantee that Fuaga, as a first round pick, is going to step in and be a great pass protecting tackle. It's pretty unlikely that he is. I think it's very similar to like Darnell Wright last year, almost identical prospects in my opinion, where um, he was a solid pass protecting tackle, but took his losses, was far from great at it. So even there, it's like, you know, you're, you're probably going to have some hiccup moments from Fuaga. I, I think you just will. But far from where the question marks lie for this offensive line, that starts at left guard with Nick Saldaveri, who just hasn't played yet. He was a fourth-round pick out of Old Dominion. Um, people that watched his tape liked him, but, you know, a small school, fourth-round pick in year two. We just don't know. The definition of a question mark. Has the traits, reportedly has the toughness, but, um, you know, in, in a rookie year where they had injuries and had to shuffle around the offensive line, um, he played 18 snaps, and in those 18 snaps gave up uh, gave up one hurry and one pressure. So, I mean, there's really not a whole lot of other analysis to say other than that. I, I think this team has earned some benefit of the doubt with the offensive line other than Trevor Penning, but they've done pretty good with these offensive linemen. Not like an amazing job or anything like that, but there's reason to believe that he will be okay, but it doesn't always work out that way, right? So could be a massive problem, and and he's not guaranteed to start either. Um, it's nice that they brought in really three guys that have played, Lucas Patrick, Ole Udo, Shane Lemieux. All guys could play left guard and um, raise the floor a little bit there, specifically with Lucas Patrick, but... You know, ask Bears fans. They would tell you, you don't really want Lucas Patrick starting either. So there's your left guard spot. And then center, there's your rock, Eric McCoy. Dude's a stud. Had a monster season as a run blocker last year. I think has all the athleticism to be that pivot point center in these wide zone schemes where he can reach a two tech and get on the move, climb to the second level if necessary, find a linebacker. Um, love how he's going to play this year. Pass protection. Um, he's good. You do see losses from him. Sometimes he just forgets to move his feet. Um, you don't really see him get pushed back too often in terms of his anchor. But, um, you know, very good kind of borderline top 10 center there in Eric McCoy. Really good on screens, too. He's He's got, you know, a, a good targeting system uh, to get down the field and, and open up some space for a team that does like to run a lot of screens, or at least did under Carmichael's offense. Then he got Cesar Ruiz. I was pretty critical when they gave him that big contract extension after he had been basically like the 49th best guard in the NFL in his tenure as a starter here. He maybe climbed up to being like the 37th best guard. Uh, he had a solid year watching this team back. I, I felt like... You still saw some of those losses, some head-scratching moments where he wouldn't see a stunt or would be late to recognize a shift and you know, kind of get turned around or stop his feet. Sometimes he just struggles with his hands and gets beat by power. He's just a very inconsistent player, but um, there's been more consistency in his game in terms of winning as a run blocker, finding the right assignment. That was a big deal with him is you'd see guys just cross his face or – um, you know, him not getting to the second level. I feel like he's getting better at that and just better in pass protection in general. So he's he's fine, still probably a little bit overpaid, but um, he's he's far from your biggest problem, but he will lose, right? And then, man, uh, apparently Trevor Penning is going to be the starting right tackle. Uh, it, it, you know, a lot of Saints fans will, will play the optimist and say, no, it's going to be Ryan Ramchek. And if that's the case, we, we've broken that down. That's much better. You're just counting on, you know, Fuaga to to play well as a rookie, and then you're hoping Saldaveri hits and you can give him help. This would climb to being much more of like a top 20 offensive line if you can put Ryan Ramchek in there. And and frankly, this team would climb in the power rankings, probably uh, one or two spots. But based on the information we have right now, it's just not looking like that's going to happen. And even then, it's like, can he stay healthy? A guy that's 
played worse and worse every year and um, missed a lot of time last year. So we're going to go with Penning at right tackle here based on the information we have right now. And you're just counting on wild leaps and bounds from the former first round pick that they couldn't even play last year in a year where they had to take Andrews Pete and kick him out to left tackle and just bench Trevor Penning. Like that's how bad he was. And this was the thing when they, they took him in the top 20 of the draft when they desperately needed a left tackle. You know, he is a hyper athlete that loves to hit people, loves to block, but from a technique standpoint, really didn't need any at Northern Iowa. When you're that athletic with these traits against that level of competition. And the problem is he has continued to play with that mentality in the NFL. And that's when you lead to seeing, like, that's how you end up getting a guy like this benched is that it it seems to indicate he's not taking to coaching. He's not trying. Well, I can't say he's not trying to get better, um, but he's failing to get better. And we saw that all play out last year. So that, that has to change. You're hoping that the benching and, and really the fact that this is a make or break year for him can lead to that development. And then it's like, you're just getting started because even if he does show growth and gets better, there's so much to clean up from his feet to his head that you just can't possibly expect that he's going to be a plus pass protector. You would almost certainly, even if he gets a little bit better, you would almost certainly expect continuations of some of the things that have led to him getting beat, whether it's stopping his feet or letting guys into his chest where he loses against power All the time. His hand placement is garbage. He just simply didn't see the length and the power at Northern Iowa that he's getting in the NFL. And he's really struggled to deal with that. And even in the run game, he's been super inconsistent. Misses assignments, whiffs, like falls off blocks. He can't just win off of his athleticism like he did at UNI. You will see some incredible highlight blocks from him with his play style and his athleticism, but um, definitely more bad than good there. So there's no other way to slice it. You you couldn't possibly feel confident with Trevor Penning out there, and you can't feel confident with Ryan Ramchick out there either, given the health situation. So this is where I look at the team, and I, I do genuinely think this will likely be downgraded and could leave this as a worse off offense than they were last year. Even if the weaponry and the coaching is a little bit better, Derek Carr is a quarterback that needs, desperately needs good pass protection. And we saw last year, like first half of the year, the pass pro sucked. Second half of the year, even without Ramchick out there, they figured out the left side of the line a little bit more. Derek Carr's blind side, he started to make some more throws down the field. So you are risking getting back to that first half of last season, Derek Carr. And the Derek Carr throughout his career where, you know, he him under pressure is, you could argue, not even one of the 32 best quarterbacks in the National Football League. He does not know how to handle it, even in a way that some guys like Jacoby Brissett and Gardner Minshew have some of that reactionary ability when the pass rush gets in. Carr is a dumpster fire. And him specifically is a quarterback that I think offensive line is more of a priority than weaponry. So I'm just being honest. um, This will make or break the season, whether that's Ramchick finding a way to get healthy, whether it's, you know, Fuaga somehow being an elite left tackle, um, Saldaveri being a hit, and then you can help Trevor Penning and maybe Trevor Penning comes along. Um, This, this offensive line simply has to be better than the picture we're painting right now. And there's a lot of work to be done to ensure that that doesn't happen. And it's a good transition as we wrap up the offense here. I have them ranked as my 29th ranked offense. And that's certainly closer to what they were in the first half of last season than the second half. Because they did start to figure things out as the year went on. And and granted, part of this is a a lot of teams showed a lot of improvement in the offseason on the offensive side of the ball that the Saints didn't necessarily, but obviously just not not a lot of expectations for this to be some great offense. Um, there is a world, though, that this could be the 18th best offense if you fix some of the offensive line stuff. If one of those other 
weapon steps up to be a good ancillary piece to Chris Olave and, and the offensive coaching can kind of show to be fun and exciting and new. Like there, there are pieces of optimism for this season, but the nice thing is all of those are, you know, things that will help you bridge into better teams in the future, right? Young weapons, a lot of young pieces on the O line, theoretically a young coach that could be around for a while there is a, a bit of a ironic beauty, if you will, to the fact that Derek Carr is just, it just doesn't matter. It's everything around him that's going to have to lift this group up. You know exactly what Derek Carr is. But let's transition to Dennis Allen's defense that was a very above average unit again last year. I would certainly argue overachieved based on some of the injuries in the secondary and the complete and utter lack of a pass rush that they had last season. And, you know, that is an area as we start with the defensive line here that they're hoping will be improved. I don't think they're expecting this to be dramatically improved, but um, I mentioned it in the intro, but this, this group had nobody. And I mean, nobody, unless Brian Brzee hit on one of his swim moves that was able to win one-on-one -on -one reps last year. Enter the Chase Young signing. Um, you know, you're, this was not a team in play for a Daniil Hunter. They just didn't have the, the money to throw around there. Um, but for what they had to pay him, you know, it was a, it was a good gamble to make on a, a dude that, again, can win one-on-one -on -one pass rush snaps and do more than just push the pocket, be disruptive, be a weapon on stunts, because that... Honestly, without getting too far into it, like that's Carl Granderson, Tano Passignon, Cam Jordan. They they had one of the worst edge groups in the league last year. We'll, we'll get into those guys a little bit more, but you know, Young is it was was the one area that they looked at this team and were like, yeah, we, we got to spend some money there. So I, I like the approach. You had a polarizing season last year, man. It was coming off back to back injuries. Obviously, this generational prospect, yada yada. Um, who early in his career was kind of living up to the hype a little bit, but um, just a, a rapid fall off with the injuries. And then last year hits, contract year, all that. They, they declined his fifth year option, kind of to a lot of people's surprise, but um, there was reasons for it. The guy couldn't stay healthy, but came out, electric start was, I, I would say in the first like eight weeks of the season, looked like the old Chase Young. Looked like a top 15, top 20 edge rusher, was winning one-on-ones, great pressure rate, great pass rush win rate, had the sacks, you name it. And then they trade him to San Francisco. Looked like a big win of a trade for San Fran. Felt like he was going to continue his success because why wouldn't he get only better getting to play with Bosa and Armstead and Hargrave? And uh, it actually went the opposite direction for one reason or another. He just wasn't a great fit. I would have to do a deep film study into why that necessarily was. Could have something to do with the amount of stunts and the way that they play their fronts. He's maybe just a little bit better lining head up on a tackle, beating them one-on-one, -on -one, whereas San Fran wants you rushing wide, running stunts, twists and games and all that stuff. And they kind of let Bosa be the one-on-one -on -one eater. You know, just a theory, but, uh, you know, was was basically a non-factor for the 49ers. And what was strange is he's been a great run defender throughout his career, gets to San Francisco, and teams were running right at him. And it, it, it almost looked like a lack of effort. Like he got to San Fran and felt like he didn't have to try. Like things were just going to happen, um, surrounded with all that talent. So it, it, it wasn't, I know I'm painting it as like a, colossal disaster he still had his moments he get a sack in the super bowl he was still a useful player but certainly it wasn't this great story where you reunite the ohio state edge rushers bosa and chase young were both kind of generational back-to-back -back type of talents put them back on the d-line and just have this elite edge duo it just it just didn't play out they let him walk and the market for him wasn't that big he gets a, a one-year prove it deal for the saints and i think as a starting point you're hoping you can get the guy that was in washington last year 
not the guy that was in San Francisco, because we give him a 79 grade as a rusher, that's probably closer to what he was in Washington than what he was in San Francisco. So there is risk to this signing. It's why he was available for the price that they got him at, but there is reward to this signing as well. And I certainly get why they made it, because they weren't in a position to spend a bunch of money, but they needed a guy that could be what Chase Young could be. So he is certainly one of the wild cards for this entire team in terms of health and production. And then you're just right back to what this group had last year. So let's stick with the defensive end edge group. I do think with Carl Granderson there, it's a nice piece to have to kind of let Chase Young just focus on the pass rush stuff, which is is good for some of the effort stuff we talked about where he doesn't have to worry about you know, smashing a tackle on first down. Um, but also just in terms of stamina and health, if he only has to play 450 snaps here and just focus on winning one-on-ones as a pass rusher on second and long and passing downs, um, could be good for Chase Young, especially from an efficiency standpoint. But uh, Carl Granderson is a very useful edge, and they even play him inside in some of their base looks where he'll get matched up on guards, and he can hold his own as a four-eye, a lot of length, a lot of strength, a high-effort player without a lot of technique and know-how of of how to win as a rusher. Just not a lot of a pass rush plan and um, a very stiff guy as well, so not a lot of bend and, and that kind of stuff, but plays his role as a five-tech, as a four-eye, and is a, is a nice rotational complement to Chase Young, as we described. And then, honestly, Cam Jordan at this stage in his career is effectively that player as well, just on the other side. Um, I I can't stress enough how bad Cam Jordan has been in the last two seasons. It, it's to the point that I still have respect for his effort, his um, his traits as a run defender, and and maybe once in a blue moon he will win with a bull rush still a high effort player it's you know you're talking about a fall off from a hall of fame player um so he's still gonna have moments of effectiveness but relative to what cam jordan used to be and them still counting on him to be cam jordan when he just can't do that anymore there's no twitch there's there's just not a pass rushing profile there anymore his tape especially in the second half of the year was honestly hard to watch and it's reflected in his production as well in in the final seven weeks of the season he had three pressures in seven games no sacks he was a sitting duck out there and and maybe he got hurt but you know it was the same story in 2022 started okay and then fell straight off i just i'm very surprised he didn't retire um I get it. Go get your money. He obviously has interest in a media career, and maybe him still playing in the NFL helps that path. But I, I just think you can make a pretty strong argument that outside of run defense, where he's still that big physical edge, he he kind of actively hurts this team. And he's holding back your development as well to at least see what an Isaiah Foskey could do. Um, so definitely not an optimistic conversation there with Cam Jordan. And then Tano Passanio, you know, kind of the same story. They love these big, smashing defensive ends that can slide inside. Just length, strength, physicality, no touch, you know? He's a seven foot, 300 pound center with no post moves, if you will. Can't shoot a three. Um, but there's a time and a place for that type of player. And and he'll get his snaps as well. He, he, he can have a bull rush from time to time, but um, that's that's kind of the type they like. Now, you have Isaiah Foskey. Uh, year one was certainly a I told you so moment for me. Um, was the 40th pick in the draft. I had a third to a fourth round grade on him. Hated that pick. Can't can't say I was right yet, but year one, it certainly was like, why did they take that dude so early? He, to me, screamed adequate rotational edge rusher in the league. You know, if he's your third or fourth guy, can get you some pressures here, can get you some run stops there, but... Um, you know, entirely stiff dude that only has a bull rush and isn't that good at it. So he's here. He's their fifth edge player, fourth, depending how you want to slice the rotation. Um, 
I, I think you still would at least like to see some playing time and see if he could be a piece, but um, he's an afterthought already. And then Peyton Turner, same story. Second round pick that I hated. He, he's had a hard time staying healthy, and he's another one of these kind of just smashers, tweener types. Not really a, a, a home for him on this D-line. So they, they are deep in terms of talent base, but there's no there's no top heavy aspect to this group at all. And at the end of the day, I mean, even Chase Young included, it's better than last year, but even Chase Young, at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, if you want to just kind of block five and leave your tackles on an island, all right, I'm fine doing that against the Saints. There's not really a guy here where I'm like, uh, we got to keep that tight end to chip. We got to slide that way. You know, if Chase Young kills you, he kills you. It's a good enough signing. It's going to help them from where they were last year. He'll, he'll get you some more, you know, third down stops here and there. But, um, yeah, man, it's, it's not a great starting point with the edge group. And then the interior defensive line is is not a very, you know, optimistic conversation either, especially in terms of depth. Now, I'm not going to lie, man. This is why I love doing the film as I get ready for this series uh, every video of this series, I thought Colin Sanders' film was pretty good for a guy that did not have good PFF grades. Really going back to Kansas City, um, but got a you know decent signing here for the Saints. And this time last year, I was like, you know, kind of an overpay, not much of a factor. I think he's a starting caliber defensive tackle. This dude had insane physical traits that I think is starting to figure stuff out. And, and his film certainly popped more to me here with the Saints than it ever did with the Chiefs. And sometimes it just takes time for these guys. So I'm not going to shit on Colin Sanders. I think he's a solid player. He's not a difference maker. And even if his run defense impressed me, I thought there were double teams where he um, did anchor better than I would have thought. He had some run stops that I was like, okay, he's seeing – plays in the backfield he's getting off blocks um and to be fair he did grade out much better per pff in the second half of the year so you're hoping that that can continue for him so i'm not going to dunk on him he's a very solid player that probably um you know i'll just give you a little behind the scenes this was a c minus d line run defense grade before i got to the film and you know if you see some tweaks and adjustments to the to where these teams rank that's the kind of stuff that's happening behind the scenes. I watched the film on the Saints, and I'm like, I got to bump this group up a little bit. Colin Sanders, as their number one defensive tackle, isn't great, but he does get the job done. He's fine. So that's what's going on there. As a pass rusher, he's more of just in splashes. You see his quickness, um, and even occasionally some power show up, but he's still very much putting things together there as well. And then if if Brian Brzee can reach his potential, this can actually be a, be a good one-two punch on the inside. I actually think it can be because I love Brian Brzee. As hard as I've been on the Saints defensive line picks from Foskey to Turner, even going back to trading two first-round picks for Marcus Davenport, um, I was not hard on them for where they got Brian Brzee. And I, I was a huge believer in him as a prospect. And in year one, I think he showed you everything you could have hoped for. A young, raw player coming out of Clemson that didn't get to play a lot because of injuries and some um, just a, a tough college path. With the COVID year, his sister got brain cancer. Brzee had injuries. It was, you know, for a, I think, like the number one or like super highly recruited dude coming out of high school, um, underproduced based on expectations in college, but still plenty of reasons to believe that things could get better in his pro career. You did not expect him to step in and be dominant right away, but I think he gave you everything you could have hoped for based on his profile with plenty of splash plays as a rusher, showed insane foot speed. If you want to talk about agility for a defensive tackle, it doesn't get a lot better than Brian Brzee. His ability to kind of redirect and essentially use like jukes where it makes it look like he's going into one gap and then he's able to swim into the other gap. That is a baseline um, paired with his ability to pull off, um, you know, a, a, a spin move is really nice. And then he can use that threat to set up the bull rush where he showed some flashes there as well. 
I think you actually saw some development from what he was at Clemson in terms of, okay, he's starting to put together some rush moves and a bit of a pass rush plan. And and it's not like he was getting a ton of playing time and a ton of time to set stuff up. Like, again, year one was very promising for him. And if you told me, okay, he's going to get about 500 snaps, almost 400 of them as a pass rusher, and he would have 31 pressures and five sacks, four QB hits, I'd be like, all right, that's a great start for his career. And then even as a run defender, very polarizing because just like at Clemson, plays with very high pad level, plays at about 295 pounds, horrible technique, and quote-unquote, he's weird. I hate to call him undersized because he looks the part, but he is light, um, right about 295, 300 pounds. So if he gets a double team, he's going about five yards backwards, and that's where you're going to see a lot of those um, negative plays. Or even if he's getting down blocked, um, hitting the wrong leverage, he will go backwards. So that's where you're hoping he can get better at at processing where he's getting pushed from. Um, you know, you can drop the dead leg. There's different things you can do to get better at your anchor, uh, including getting better in the weight room and, and just improving your pad level in general. So there's area for improvement. But some of the foot speed, the arm strength, the ability to just shed one-on-one blocks, you actually did see some run stops from Brian Brzee as well to the point where you're like, okay, as a three-tech, can he be a penetrator and, and a disruptor of a run defender? Yeah, I, I think he can. So in terms of potential superstars on this team and transitioning to the next era of New Orleans Saints football, this is the guy where you're like, man, can, can we get a monster year two from Brian Brzee and, and have, some, have a young guy in this defense? Because right now your, your superstars are – Demario Davis, Marshawn Lattimore, and Tyron Matthew. Like, can we get a young guy here where we're like, yes, we finally hit on one of these defensive linemen? I think it's in the in the realm of possibility for Brian Brzee. So I really like him. And then it really falls off. You know, you have Nathan Shepard, who was another mid-sized free agent signing from them last year. Undersized penetrator, um, can get you some pressures. Um, but you're really hoping he doesn't have to play much with Brian Brzee taking that step this year. Kendall Vickers, uh, uh, just turn the you know same player, turn the knob down another 30%. Hence the Christian Boyd pick in the sixth round. They needed somebody other than Colin Sanders that isn't going to go five yards backwards every snap against the run, and that's Christian Boyd. Uh, um, as a rookie, unfortunately, I think that's all he can do. Uh, he has a remarkable anchor, great strength, put up, what, like 40 bench reps or something, but not an athlete, no foot speed, doesn't necessarily shed a lot of blocks, but if it's third and one and you need to throw someone out there that isn't going to go backwards, Christian Boyd can do that. So I do think he'll play based on the construction of the rest of this team. And then Jack Heflin uh, has bounced around, hasn't stuck anywhere. So it's a very, very thin defensive tackle group, and that is also a factor in terms of the overall D-line run defense grade because – Having you know a thir- at least a third piece that is a good run defender is is an asset for a lot of teams, and they don't really have that. So, especially not until Christian Boyd shows what he can do as a as a late day three pick. Um, so, in terms of grading this group out, they are C's down the middle. They have a lot of bodies. They play hard, but you are really counting on Brian Brzee taking a leap and Chase Young being something. And those are far from givens, but there is potential there, especially if Brian Brzee can take the leap. But if, you know, if Brian Brzee takes a big jump and Chase Young is what he was in the first half for Washington last year, this could actually be more of a good top half pass rush in the league. Call it a, you know, the 16th best pass rush as opposed to the, you know, um, tied for 26th that we have right now. And then you're going to see that permeate throughout the rest of the defense. And this could be a much better overall unit to be determined i suppose but let's talk about the linebackers it's a it's a really talented linebacker room i I love the starters and frankly i love the depth with some of the additions they made you start with demario davis who even though he's 35 years old this dude defies age he's he's seemingly getting better with age and 
I'm I've bet on him to slow down three years in a row in this series. I, I can't do that anymore. I'm convinced this guy could play till he's 38 because he doesn't rely on speed. He's always a step ahead. He's incredibly physical. He's as smart as they come in terms of run fits, diagnostics, being a step ahead where he, he's not counting on that speed. Oh, and by the way, he's actually 250 pounds. What, what top 10 linebackers are that big? I mean, none of them. So he has rare play strength for these great linebackers. I mean, he's he's pretty firmly in the conversation for me for who's the best linebacker in the NFL not named Fred Warner or um, Roquan. Really, the only negative thing I have to say is he is 35 years old. How long can he do it? Again, I'm not projecting him to slow down, but you got to at least consider the possibility that that might finally happen this year. And then Pete Werner, heading into a contract year, mind you, is is about as good as you can ask for an LB2. You know, there's a couple other better LB2s in the league, but not many. I mean, he would he would be the best linebacker on a lot of teams, and depending on how much cap space the Saints have, he could be a guy that gets a striking amount of money next offseason. But he's a he's a balanced player, plays at about I think about 6'2, 230-ish, 235 pounds. He can run, he doesn't have like elite speed. I don't think his like hip fluidity to man guys up is great. That's where you see some of his coverage losses. Um, and he's a risk taker in zone. He makes a lot of splash plays in zone, but we'll get, you know, we'll get beat. We'll give up some yardage as well. Hence the, the kind of average coverage grade from him, but he's a head hunter and run defense, but keeps his discipline. He's a good tackler. Like there's so much to like about Pete Werner. I was dead wrong, um, on him. As a draft prospect, I did not like that draft pick, and he has shattered my expectations um, and, and, frankly, has beaten expectations of a day-two linebacker as well. So he's, he's a really good player. Again, about as good as you can ask for for an LB2 in the league. And just with that, I mean, that's where you get, for me, the third best overall linebacker room in the league, uh, top four for linebacker run defense. Both these guys play the run extremely well with size. And then top 10 for coverage. You know, both these guys are better in run defense than they are in coverage, but both are more than good enough in terms of everything they ask them to do to slow down the pass as well. But it doesn't stop there. They made four really good additions to this group, including Willie Gay, who is a really fun addition to this room and is, is going to be exactly what he was for the Chiefs, where you're not asking him to be the Mike. You're not asking him to be really a starter as your number two linebacker. You you want him out there um, on unique base packages where you want three linebackers out there. Sometimes you know they might want to walk Werner or Demario Davis up on the line of scrimmage and let Willie Gay play in space, or they might want to take Werner off the field and blitz Willie Gay, or you know use Willie Gay manned up on a certain matchup but he is he's a freaky athlete that loves to fly around a lot of instincts really good hands um when quarterbacks do make mistakes he's a a risk taker in zone can give them a little bit more speed and depth in certain situations if they want some speed to be a QB spy if they have a tough matchup on a rushing threat there are a lot of different ways that Dennis Allen can deploy Willie Gay and I think he looks at having to lose Caden Ellis a couple years ago to the Falcons, who did a lot of that versatility stuff, um, looks at that role and was like, I kind of want that guy back. So that only makes things better here to have that just extra versatility, a little extra depth. Werner has been banged up time to time. So I like that signing. And then, dude, I'm not going to lie. I don't want to get too far into it, but Kalik Hudson, uh, Hudson for the Commanders, I think I, I've talked about this with with various other players but there are guys where when i'm doing the film these guys pop and i wish i would have recorded footage on them but they're oftentimes like not relevant enough that i was focused on recording them and then by the time i wish i, I gathered b-roll on them i'm like crap like i could have featured that dude Khalid hudson was making some plays for the commanders i was a little surprised they let him go but you know they they had their own plan at linebacker um Again, as a weak side backer, someone that was a converted safety, never really 
was given an opportunity from Ron Rivera, but finally in the second half of his fourth season, got out there and was was flying around making stuff happen. So as, as a special teamer and linebacker depth, not really a starting opportunity for him, but man, I like that. Then you draft Jalen Ford in the fifth round, big-bodied, balanced linebacker, smart dude, just tight hips, not a great athlete, unlikely to ever be a starter, um, but as, as a depth piece, smart guy. And then you're kind of running out of spots there, but Nephi Sewell uh, actually did start the Lions game, which was one of the three games I watched for this team, and I was like, dang, he's balling out, but maybe that's just because he was going against Penne on the other side. I, I don't know, but... Um, he definitely popped in that one game. And then, I mean, man, Anthony Orgy was a really athletic, traitsy dude out of Vanderbilt. DeMarco Jackson's a really um, kind of big hitter with some speed. They even signed Monty Rice, who I refuse to give up on. It's it's a remarkably deep linebacker room that is um, potentially one of the more underrated groups in the entire league. It's just kind of unfortunate that... Um, it's linebackers, right? They can only make so much of an impact on a defense, but they do about as about as much as as any any group could. All right, then we have the last position group here, the secondary, um, an uber talented yet aging question uh, uh, secondary with some question marks, but still to me one of the premium assets of this team. I rank them in the top five. With a B plus coverage grade, still very optimistic about this unit. Um, granted, as we start the conversation with CB one Marshawn Lattimore, it's just challenging to say how much you're going to get from him from a health perspective. Yet again, last year only made it through half the season. He's been a guy that seemingly misses at least five games like every year, but it was more than that last year. He is um, 28 years old, so getting up there a little bit. He has even been thrown out there as a potential sort of um, trade piece for more of a rebuild for the Saints, clear some cap. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's fair to say there's some question marks there. Not so much questions in terms of who he is when he's on the field, He's that shut down, in your face, one on one, man corner with good zone feel as well. Um, not the most tenacious run defender, but gets the job done. I mean, um, yeah, again, there's just not a lot of questions about who he is when he's on the field. He hasn't quite been that elite shutdown guy that he maybe was several years ago. But when he's out there, you got an alpha, you got a number one, and then you just piggyback off that with everybody else you can shift away from him you can do a lot of creative stuff with your coverage unit when he's out there um, but you know this team did draft kool-aid mckinstry they traded up to get him in the second round not a coincidence and just as we've seen for a couple years now there is a a very likely scenario where there are maybe seven or eight games this year where we're talking about the starting three corners are Paulson Adebo, Alante Taylor, and Kool-Aid McKinstry. And honestly, as a trio, now that they have drafted Kool-Aid, and kind of what we saw with um, Isaac Yudam really stepping up last year too, they made it work really well, actually. And these guys are all somewhat similar in the sense that they can get in your face and play man coverage and do... The demands of, of this defense there, but they all have some different strengths as well. You know, Paulson Adebo to me is the really highest upside corner here that heading into a contract year based on, you know, after what he did last year where he really stepped up when Marshawn Lattimore went down, this could be a huge year for Adebo, hopefully with a better pass rush in front of him too, where he can take the mantle as CB1 here, and they could feel good about moving on from Marshawn Lattimore. He ha he's 6'1", 190 pounds. He's great speed, um, you know, good, good hips, good foot speed, willing press man corner that will get in your face. But, you know, just a smarter, more balanced player than a guy like Elante Taylor and a better athlete than someone like Kool-Aid McKinstry who's got some of those speed concerns. And we'll get to those two, but... Again, for me, Paulson Adebo very much could be 
Um, think of like a Jalen Johnson, who in year four for Chicago last year blew up and turned into a CB1. Could that happen for Paulson Adebo this year? I'd put him up there with some of these other exciting young players that could hit and then help ease that transition into a younger, different Saints team. Still has some losses, though. Um, just from an overall coverage consistency standpoint, still has a little bit to go before you feel good about him being that you know, consistent number one piece. And then with Elante Taylor, I go back and forth with him all the time because when he has a good game or even like when he makes a, one of his highlight plays, you're like, dude, he has alpha like elite corner traits. He's six foot, has insane speed. His recovery is nuts. His ball skills are great. There's no lack of physicality in his game. It's just, I just don't know how good his football awareness is, how good his zone IQ is, because even though the Saints want to run man coverage, they're still going to be in zone 55, 60% of the time. And that's, you know, you see some miscommunications, some coverage busts with Elante Taylor, and then he has to count on his recovery. And you're just going to get a lot of inconsistency in that way. So I go back and forth at this point in terms of like, is that stuff going to come around? I still, man, in, in year three, in the same defense, with plenty of opportunities, like I still think it could happen, um, especially as a CB2. You know, when you think of, of some other CB2s in the league where you don't have to guard number one and you're getting some, you know, lesser quality targets thrown your way um, because teams are trying to stay away from your number one, that's where you could see the ball skills and the playmaking um, show up more and you'll live with some more of the inconsistencies. So there is a world where he's a really good number two corner, but they are also prepared for him to kind of stay as he has been, which is a really good matchup dime corner. And then Kool-Aid McKinstry can step in as the number three corner. And I think Kool-Aid can play in the slot. I think he can play outside. I think he can really do whatever you want with Kool-Aid. And, and the Saints haven't really been a team that confines themselves to you're the slot corner. They like that flexibility to shadow and play matchups and move guys around. So it makes sense why they took Kool-Aid, who has some of that flexibility. But he's like the complete opposite of Elante Taylor in that Kool-Aid just depends on technique and physicality. I mean, he's teach tape for the press man corner, runs his feet, keeps his composure. Even when he loses a step, he doesn't panic. He doesn't grab. He understands his positioning. And he's also, he has, even though he's, I can't call him undersized. He's got good size. He's just under six foot, about 190 pounds. Um, but... You know, he's not 6'1", 6'2", like a, a, a Debo, uh, or I can't remember how tall Lattimore is, but um, just just slightly shorter. But anyway, and, and not as fast, but what I'm getting at here is he has disproportionately long arms, like 33-inch arms or something like that, and he uses them as a weapon to basically attach his arms on guys. Um you know, holding, defensive holding, but they're never going to call it because he just kind of floats it there. It's so subtle. It's never redirecting guys. It's just there as a bumper to slow guys down and then kind of ride that wave like, you know, drift in Mario Kart to help his speed as well. It's something Xavier Howard has made a living off of um, with a lack of long speed. So he's really good at that. Um, helps him from not getting beat over the top too much. So I like Kool-Aid, man. I, I definitely would. If someone took him in the first round, I bet it would have been like, yeah, makes sense to me. He's a damn good corner. So to get him in the second round, it was almost like too good of a player and too good of a fit for the Saints with what they want to do to not make that move. Even if right now you don't necessarily know how this is all going to sort out, whether it's trading Lattimore or Elante Taylor just kind of flames out, you, you got options and you got depth in a way that they um, – well, they, they locked into it last year with Isaac Yadam, but they weren't going to count on that again with, with a player like that. So invest in a Kool-Aid McKinstry, it makes sense. Not even really worth diving into the depth after that. You know, Will Will Harris is a utility piece, a special teamer. Um, Ugo Amadi, you know, he can play some slot, can play some safety. Rajon Wright 
was a prospect with some length last year. Shamar Jean Charles, um, you know, has barely played after getting drafted by the Packers. There's just not a lot um, to really mention there beyond those four. Um, but you, you do got to mention, I mean, it's a, it's a damn good safety room. Obviously, Tyron Matthew at 32 years old, he had another great year last year. Just so smart at this point in terms of being able to play every single spot back there. Uh, it's not a coincidence he went, you know, we've already drawn a lot of parallels, parallels from uh, Steve Spagnolo to what the Saints do. Schematically, it's very similar where they want these safeties, one play to man a guy up, one play you're a deep free safety, the next play you're playing strong safety, the next you're rotating down as a buzz. They want you to be able to do everything. And, I mean, Tyron Matthew at this point has done everything, can do everything, doesn't seem to be slowing down. Um, heading into a contract year as well. I mean, if he plays like he did last year, he's going to earn another big contract. He's just been a, a phenomenal safety for for so long. Um, there was a point in time where I, I thought he was a little overrated, uh, maybe all the way back when he like had that one year in Houston. But, I mean, he's just gotten better with age. I, I really think his coverage consistency has ramped up, um, and, and he's become a better deep free safety as well. So he's just he's a monster, man. I think he's... In the conversation for top, I'll, I'll play it safe and say top eight safeties in the NFL right now, but an obvious weapon for this unit. And then uh, Jordan Howden, another one of those guys that just popped on film. Um, and uh, he, he was interesting coming out of Minnesota because you, you looked at his testing numbers, his size, you're like, he's kind of got everything. He's six foot, 200 pounds, runs, good agility scores. Uh, didn't really give up a lot at Minnesota, but wasn't much of a playmaker. And uh, I think in this Saints defense that allowed him to kind of trigger a little bit more, match guys up, buzz down, um, see guys coming cross field. You didn't see any interceptions from him, but you did see five pass breakups, started the second half of the year, just like he was at Minnesota, very cons- you know, you know, good tackler, good run defender, nothing special. But I do think they found a starter um, on day three of the draft. And they very clearly feel that way because they – let Marcus May go and then did literally nothing to fill out the safety room. They're very confident in him. And based on the tape he put out last year, I I can't really argue with it. So probably an underrated player on this team at this point. Um, In terms of the depth, you got Jonathan Abram, who they will put in there on dime safety looks. He's still that headhunter and, you know, wants to – Stick his head in there against the run. Looks to strip the ball out. um, Jumps routes. He's a coverage liability because he's not a great athlete and he is over aggressive. And he's very hit or miss in terms of run defense. He misses a lot of tackles, but he makes a lot of plays against the run too. I don't know how much he'll play if all four corners are healthy. But if someone goes down, I think Abram or Will Harris maybe with him being an addition here would probably be that sort of P.J. Williams dime safety, dime corner role in this defense. Um, J.T. Gray, Roderick Teamer, special teamers there to fill out the rest of the room. If you did have an injury to Tyron Matthew or Jordan Howden, I I would actually start to worry. Um, They don't really have anybody on the back end that can hold up coverage-wise. You'd probably be talking about, again, Will Harris or Ugo Amadi. Um stepping in there which i guess would be okay but uh yeah man really good group need need marshawn to stay healthy but you don't you know i can't even say need if, if you want the b plus rating to hold up that's counting on marshawn Lattimore being out there but if he goes down for six weeks they are fully well equipped to handle it and you got to give him credit for that so let's recap the defense. I have them ranked exactly as the, the 16th best defense in the league. And obviously it's it's that low-ranking defensive line that drags this group down. If you see those leaps from Chase Young and Brian Brzee this year, I, I do think this is a top-10 defense. And that's probably their path, along with, of course, some improvements on the offensive line. But that's probably their path to winning this division is just kind of getting back to – like elite Saints defense, I, I think it's in their world of outcomes. Just uh, can't rank them there until the D-line proves it because that, that's a critical piece. And we saw last year 
you know, with a with a very below average to to frankly poor D line, they were right around this point um, as a mid ranking defense. But uh, again, a little bit more promise to improve that this year. A little bit better in pass defense, by the way. 13th in pass defense and 21st in run defense. Just the way things shook down there. Um, but before we tie a ribbon on all of this, we have the special teams unit. A very interesting group because they actually ranked 32nd in PFF kicker grade with Blake Groupie. Who felt like he kicked a little bit better than that, but he did rank 32nd for PFF grade for kickers. Um, and for the special teams, we're just defaulting to these objective metrics. Um, but 31st for the rookie punter, Lou Headley. But somehow they ranked 4th in PFF team grade for special teams, 14th for DVOA team grade. So they're basically what that means is their coverage unit, their tackling, and their ball security was nutty on that side of the ball so you're obviously hoping that continues and then i actually think blake groupie was better in the second half of the year than the first half and that's not abnormal for rookie cooker uh, rookie kickers so reason to believe that could get better um but obviously as good as they were on special teams the kicker and punter are going to carry a lot of weight for this so they come in as more of a you know, average special teams, they rank 23rd. And um, yeah, I, I, I don't think we have a ton more to add there. You're just hoping the young specialists there can continue to get better. But let's wrap this up here for our 26th overall team. Again, 29th offensively. It's, it sounds harsh, but a lot of teams got better offensively, whereas I don't necessarily think the Saints did. Um, defensively, though, kind of starting them at their baseline of where they were last year, but I do think they certainly have the upside to finish closer to the top 10 in defense. And then we just broke down the special teams there. To recap their strengths and weaknesses, they do have three defined strengths for me, and it's all on the defensive side of the ball. Defensive coaching, the linebacker room, and the secondary. In terms of weaknesses, the offensive line has got to be the primary focus in terms of what could make or break this team season. I do think you have to mention that the ancillary receiving threats not named Chris Olave, while there's promise there, there is a world where, I think I said it earlier, you could walk out of this season and being like, we need two more wide receivers because um, the re you know those guys are just unproven. Um, defensive line, we, we've beaten that into the dirt, but they just have to be better than they were last year. The pieces they're counting on are unproven in Brian Brzee and Chase Young. And then I, I think you can note that the the star talent on this team is extremely old and extremely injury prone. I think on paper you would argue the four best players, maybe not named Chris Olave, so maybe four of the best five players on this team are either really old or really injury prone. Ryan Ramchek and Marshawn Lattimore being the injury prone guys, and Demario Davis, 35 years old, uh, Tyron Matthew at 32 year old safety could even throw a guy like Alvin Kamara into that conversation. So that's where you talk about the transition, you know, trying to get this team younger, some new names to talk about here. I think we did a good job highlighting who the, who they're hoping those guys will be. But let's wrap up with the schedule here. Their Vegas over-under is seven and a half wins, playing uh, one of the easiest schedules in the league with their own division being a steaming pile of dog crap. Uh, and they get to play the AFC West, which is by far the easiest of the AFC divisions, and the NFC East, which is uh, pretty top-heavy. We've already revealed the Giants and Commanders in this series. So it is actually a very easy schedule for a team that ranks 26th here. And I think that does contribute to their over under being seven and a half there. I still think that's pretty damn tight. I wouldn't bet the under here, but if I had to, I would say they're probably a seven win team. Um, honestly, their like floor and ceiling for me is like six to nine wins. It's a pretty tight window. I really just don't see the upside, especially with a guy like Derek Carr paired with some of those offensive line issues. But uh, yeah, there, there's your outlook on the Saints. 
Um, for me, it's all about that transition. Get the young players. You know, maybe you you find your way out of Derek Carr into next year. Maybe you're talking about a new coach next year, but that doesn't mean this year has to be a waste. This team can still compete, get in the mix for the NFC South. That's all good and well. They're not going to win the Super Bowl, right? They're 25th in Super Bowl odds for a reason. But, you know, this, this season can mean a lot if some of these exciting young players hit, you find that transition out of Derek Carr, and, you know, maybe this could be a team that can hit and, and figure out some freaking answers on the old line. Um, but, yeah, maybe this could be a team that hits the ground running and proves that they did kind of do this transition the right way. There's a, there's a world where that does happen. I don't want it to be all negativity on the Saints, even though they are the team that's kind of, they're kind of everybody's purgatory team, right? So it, it, I hope that I made a two-hour deep dive on a purgatory team interesting for you. Um, that's the goal of this series. If you are still here and you enjoyed and you haven't hit that like button yet, please do on the way out. Uh, Saints fans, drop your comments down below. Where did I go right? Where did I go wrong? Am I too harsh on you guys? Am I just right? Let me know all those things in the comments down below. Who do you think will be revealed next in this series? Let me know all of it down in the comments. It is good to be back. We are going to get out of here. Thank you for watching. We'll see you later. Peace out. Peace out.